I'm Bob Darrell, and I'm an alcoholic. Would you join me uh, after a moment of silence in an opening prayer I like to use? Lord, help me to set aside everything I think I know about you, everything I think I know about myself, everything I think I know about others, and everything I think I know about my own recovery for a new experience in you, Lord, a new experience in myself, a new experience in my fellows, and a much-needed new experience in my own recovery. Amen. Uh, what we're going to try to, what I'm going to try to do, and I'm not a, I'm not an expert on the big book or the steps or anything like that. What I am is a guy who, throughout the early 70s, came in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous and relapsed over and over and over again. And I tried to stay sober on the fellowship. And I couldn't understand what was wrong. Why in the why I kept going back to it uh, until I eventually in 1978 came into Alcoholics Anonymous the last time and I, I had some people that were put in my path that showed me how to put the process in this book into my life and and like everything in Alcoholics Anonymous I am just basically going to share with you my experience with that and uh, I hope that it might be useful. Um, on page 20 of the book, I wanna, there's a little paragraph that I belong to a home group in Las Vegas. It's called the Specific Group. And a lot of people think the group is named after a group in California. And it's not the, the group. The group is named after a passage that I'm going to read on page 20 that really is our purpose. And we read it at the beginning of every meeting. And it's what we're going to try to do this weekend. It says, you may already have asked yourself why it is that all of us became so very ill from drinking. Doubtless, you're curious to discover how and why in the face of expert opinion to the contrary, that we have recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. If you're an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may be already asking, what do I have to do? It is the purpose of this book to answer such questions specifically. And that's really what what my experience has been with this process in the big book is is that I learned that I had the, the spiritual malady and physical allergy of alcoholism. And the big book defines the problem. It spends, matter of fact, it spends probably two-thirds of the working text on defining the problem. And then it tells you what the solution is. And then very specifically, not off the wall like you see in the meetings, but specifically gives you blow-by-blow directions on how to implement that solution into your life. And what I want to try to share with you is my experience with that and how much it's changed my life. Um, i tell you when I, when I started and I said I'm an alcoholic, I know I'm an alcoholic because I fit the description of an alcoholic, or, or you can almost say it's a definition, but it doesn't really call it that, that it talks about in We Agnostics on page 44. It talks, the book says, if two things are present in you, you're the alcoholic that this book was written for. You're the guy that this was written for. And it's at the fourth line down on page 44, it says, if when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when drinking you have little control over the amount you take, you're probably alcoholic. I'm both of those things. You know, the thing about if when you find when you honestly want to, like really sincerely this time I mean it, unlike the other 30 times I thought I meant it. This time I really, really mean it. And it says quit entirely. What do they mean by entirely? I mean, they don't really mean entirely. I mean, I quit drinking for long periods of time to keep me properly medicated. But what I can't do is I can't stop doing everything. I'm like Dr. Bob. Uh, 
If you read Dr. Bob's story, Dr. Bob was able to stay away from alcohol for sustained periods of time with sedatives and medications. Matter of fact, in his own story, he said that he used those every day of his life for, I think it was 17 years, in order to function so he could still go to work. Because every time he was just like me, every time he started, he couldn't stop. And that's the second thing it says. Or if when you honest, uh, not only when you honestly want to, you cannot quit entirely. Or if when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take. And that was always true for me. There was something about me from the very first time I started drinking as 12 years old that I seemed to have an inability to shut it down when I should. I always went too far. And I, uh, and it said I had both of those things. I'm not only powerless over alcohol once I start drinking, but I'm powerless to stay stopped once I've been stopped. It's a double, double deal. There are some, there are, there are types of, of drinkers that, uh, I think there are two different types of alcoholics. There's acute alcoholism and chronic alcoholism. This, the book of Alcoholics Anonymous in AA was designed for chronic alcoholics. But there's an acute alcoholic, and I grew up with guys like that. And there are people who, because of their alcohol consumption, they drink so much, so heavily for so long that they, they become debilitated as a result of their massive alcohol consumption. And they are powerless over alcohol while they are drinking. Once they're in the process of drinking, they just, they always go too far. They're bad like that. But their powerlessness ends where the bottle ends. Once they've been detoxed, their alcoholism goes away. And once they make up their mind that they'll never drink again, they just do. They just don't drink no more. I grew up with guys like that. But I'm the guy that when I honestly want to, I can't quit entirely. And I've said to myself, anybody in here besides me ever said to yourself, this time, I'm never going to touch that stuff again, right? <laughs> okay, then of all the people that have said that, how many of you have touched it again? Right, yeah, right, okay. I'm that guy. I'm that guy. Don't mean to be, but I'm that guy. And we're going we're gonna to get into a little bit about why, why this thing is like that. Dr. Silkworth, uh, I think Alcoholics Anonymous owes Silky a tremendous debt. He, he really, I don't think we would be here without him, without his input to Bill Wilson about the disease of alcoholism. On, in the doctor's opinion, on page XXVIII I, in the fourth edition, I think it's a different page in the third, I'm not sure, but it's at the top of the page where it says, we believe. In the fourth edition, it's XXVIII. I, I, I. I think in the th – anybody have a third edition? No? What is it – just two eyes in the third edition? No? Is it four, three eyes? Okay. Anyway. It says, we believe and suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics – that's me, chronic. I have chronic alcoholism. I don't have acute alcoholism. My alcohol is not – my alcoholism is not induced by alcohol. And that's the, I think that's the, the this is subtle difference between me and people who are problem drinkers. I did not, I am not an alcoholic because I drank obsessively and abusively. I drank obsessively and abusively because I'm alcoholic. Very subtle difference. Very subtle difference. It's, it's what came first, the chicken or the egg. I am not, now there are, I'm not an acute alcoholic or a person has acute alcoholism. Their alcoholism comes from drinking. My drinking comes from alcoholism. I'm the guy that if you were to, if you would have, if I, when I was 15 years old, if you would have transplanted me to another planet where there was no alcohol, I'd have found some fungus or something. You know what I mean? I'd, Right? I'd have, I've been grinding rocks up and stuff. I've been finding some kind of alcohol there. You know what I'm saying? Right? It, it, that's because I got alcoholism. I'd have been found. I'd have found it. 
These chronic alcoholics, the action of alcohol on chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. And, and Silkworth talks about something, unlike other allergies, like if you have an allergy to strawberries and eat strawberries, you break out in hives. We don't break out in hives when I drink. I break out in what Silkworth calls a phenomenon of craving. That is my allergic reaction to alcohol. I ingest alcohol into my system and I develop a craving. But most of the time, I don't know that that's happening. I don't get it. Because a craving, you never realize you have a craving until you can't satisfy it. Everyone in this room right now is in the grip of a craving you're not aware of. And that's the craving to breathe air. And you're not, you never think about it because you satisfy it. But if someone were to slip up behind you with a plastic bag and put it over your head, you'd realize instantly you have this craving to breathe air. And my drinking was like that because I very, very seldom ever allowed myself to be in a position where I had three or four drinks and then could not get any more for a sustained period of time. If you've ever been in that place, it makes you crazy. It's like a stone in your shoe until you eventually got to go find some more alcohol. That's a phenomenon of craving. And Silkworth says that this phenomenon of craving is limited to this class, to us, to people with chronic alcoholism and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. And because of that, these allergic types, these guys like me, who once I take a drink, there's something in my wiring where I react to alcohol differently than non-alcoholics. My sister doesn't have alcoholism, and I watch her drink. And a funny thing, of what to me is an alcoholic, what her reaction to alcohol seems like a phenomenon to me. Just as my reaction to alcohol seems like a phenomenon to her. But she'll take about two drinks, maybe three, maybe two and a half. And you know, she starts to get that buzz. You know what I'm saying? That little buzz, that glow starts coming. And in her wiring... That buzz is interpreted as, whoa, 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 hey, <clears throat> okay, back off from this thing, getting a little out of control here. Now, my wiring is I get that same feeling and it's like, woo, you know, full speed ahead. And we're different. My sister, I could never, she would look at me and wonder, why do you got to drink yourself into stupidness every single time? And I would like, and I'd look at her and say, why do you stop when it's getting good? <laughs> you know what I mean, right? I don't understand her. But it's not a craving for her. A couple drinks of alcohol make her feel like she's losing control. A couple drinks of alcohol make me feel like I'm about to get control. I drank with an urgency. I drank with a feeling, most of my drinking, like I am about to arrive. And I suspected it was on the next drink. And that's why I always drink. I was always one drink ahead of myself. You know what I mean? You're sitting in a bar, and I'm drinking, and I'm already figuring out, better get the other one lined up. Because I always had a feeling like I'm not there yet, but I knew I was, ab I always had a sense that I'm about to be there. And I, I don't think I ever really got there except maybe in the very early days. But I spent most of my drinking being almost crazy because I'd get so close to there I could almost touch it, but I couldn't quite get it. It was just one more, one more, one more, one more, one more. And I'd come to somewhere. Don't know if I got there or not. Uh, I'm that guy. Uh, and it says that guys like me, because of this phenomenon of craving, these allergic types, it says we can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. Now, I, I imagine, I, I'm not sure what Silkworth means by that. Earlier in this chapter, he talks about um, his experience with people with alcohol and mind-altering drugs. And he, there's a book out uh, written by Charlie Towns who... Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what alcohol in any form means to you. It might mean beer, wine, whiskey, gin, and rum, and tequila. But I think, from my experience, and this is the only thing I have to base it on, is I think that for some of us, 
I don't even know about us, but I know for me, there were other things that did the same thing for me. Uh, I think there was, I was allergic not, not only to certain beverages, I'm allergic to certain pills. I can take vitamin C and aspirin all day long, never, never get weird. You give me a Valium and I'm going to end up watching a donkey act in, t in Tijuana before the week's over. You know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be somewhere crazy because it sets something off in me. And so what I, my life depended upon me finding out what are the four, what, what is alcohol to me? What does that to me? Off of me and my emotions off of me. When that, anything that'll do that for me, I've discovered that I have an allergic reaction to it and I never ever really get a feeling of getting enough. Um, I know I have this phenomenon of craving for a couple reasons. One is I look back through my whole drinking career and I'll tell you honestly, I can't tell you one moment when I was drinking where I ever really had a sense of drinking just enough. I have never had the experience of being at a bar drinking for an hour or two or in a party and have the bartender come by and say, Bob, would you like another drink? I have never known the experience of sitting there and thinking to myself, this, no, this is just right. I've never been there. It's always more, 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 more. You see, if, if that wasn't true, if I could get to just right, then I would have been able to shut it down without going too far. But when you can never get just right, you always go too far because there's never enough. And that was my experience all, every through my whole drinking. The bottom of the page, XXVII, Silkworth talks about the other aspect of the alcohol, of alcoholism from alcoholics with chronic alcoholism. If, if all there was to alcoholism was the phenomenon of craving, then uh, Betty Ford, or then uh, Nancy Reagan, when she said that deal, just say no, would have worked for people like me. But what is it about me that after three or four treatment centers, after getting arrested, after getting it, getting it, that this is destroying me and making up my mind, this time I mean it, I'm never going to touch that stuff. What is it about me that draws me back to that in spite of overwhelming information that to drink again is a very bad idea for me? Silkworth touches on it, this insanity, this sickness of heart that we have at the bottom of this page. And he says, men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. And I think that's probably true for everybody. The difference between me and non-alcoholics is not only do I like the effect, there's something inside me that yearns for the effect, that needs the effect, secretly needs the effect. This sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the true from the false. The last couple years of my drinking were pathetic. I had crossed into a realm of alcoholism where I had wrung all the fun out of it. And I'm not, it's, it's no longer the kind of drinking where I am at a bar and I'm shooting pool and dancing and talking to the girls and I'm getting laid and meeting people. It's no longer the type of alcoholism where where alcohol is a social lubricant, it's no longer the deal where it's a party. And yet, I, I can't uh, differentiate the true from the false because every time after a period of several months of abstinence and I will start a run again, I will start the run with a high level of anticipation that it's going to be like it was when I was 18 years old in, in spite of the reality that it hadn't been that way for two or three years, I will become convinced it's going to be like that again. Because I don't want to face the truth. I don't know. I would rather believe the delusion. You know what delusion is? It's psychotic, wishful thinking. 
It's like evidence is it's not this way, oh, but I want it to be that way so bad that I'm willing to, to alter my vision of reality in my mind to imagine that it can be that way again. Now, I've not only been that kind of delusional about alcohol, I've been that way in relationships, about all kinds of stuff. I mean, just wacko, crazy stuff. I can't differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. Not only do I adjust to the damage I create in my life, and I just, you know, it's really kind of sad when you, at the, the end of the last couple of years of my drinking, if uh, if you were to ask me how I was doing and I had enough money in my pocket to get drunk that day, I'd have probably told you I was doing fine. If you'd have asked my mother how I was doing, she would have broken into tears. But see, as I spiraled down into oblivion and, and lower levels of degeneration and more, crossed all those barriers and those lines I'd never cross and do the things that I told myself I'd never do and living with the lies and the hurt and the disappointment and the broken relationships and the lost jobs, I just adjust to that journey to hell. Every step of the way, I make it normal for me. Somehow, I alter my view of reality. This is okay. And it's because the, the road to hell is not like a ski jump. It's an incremental thing. It's just gradual. They call it a progressive illness. It's a gradual thing. To me, my, it seems the only normal one in that my, the big secret and the thing that I don't want anybody to realize, I don't even want to face myself. And it's one of the reasons I return to drinking when it's even though I know it's killing me is that the only time in my life I really ever felt normal. The only is when I, in the early days, when I was half lit up. It's the only time I ever really felt like you looked. It was the only time that I ever able, was able to fit and integrate myself with you the way you always seemed to do so easily. If you ever remember the, that feeling of separation, of loneliness, of, of being at, sober at a party or a dance and standing back in the corner watching everybody else integrate in that sick, lonely feeling, almost as if there's an invisible yet impenetrable barrier between me and you that you guys can, don't have and you connect with each other and then there's me. And I'm distant and apart from... And five shots of tequila, and the barrier goes away, and I am as a part. I feel like you look. I connect and can talk to you and come out and play, and I'm a part of the way you've always looked to me to be that I could never do on my own. And to see the real reality, my big secret is that I, oh, I really feel that's normal to me. That's normal to me. Now, to the rest of the world, when I'm drunk, I don't look normal. I look drunk. But to my internal reality, that's a better grade of normal than I am when I look normal to the rest of you and I'm sober, but feel so apart from. My alcoholic life seems the only normal one. And then this is the part. This is Silkworth. This next line touches on the spiritual malady. He doesn't call it that at this party. Later he refers to it. He says to me, to us, to them, these, these chronic alcoholics, they are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks which they see others taking with impunity. Well, what's that mean? That means I get sober and my, as I enter into abstinence, I become restless irritable and discontent unless I can once again experience the, the thing I got from alcohol. That's why I go back to it. So for all practical purposes, my alcoholism starts where the bottle ends. I enter into a state of abstinence, and the further I get from the last drink, the more restless, irritable, and discontent I become. And if you don't know what that means, I think you do. If you're a real alcoholic, 
You, every alcoholic I've ever known has had that subtle, low-level feeling of restlessness. It's, it's, a, it's like an inability to feel settled in your own life. It's, it's, you ever watch a dog circle a room looking for its spot to lay down? I'm a dog who can't find its spot, right? There's a restlessness about it. And irritable is that life and people especially rub me the wrong way. They irritate me. They threaten me. And I don't even... I don't even connect the dots and understand that that's what's going on. But one, I find myself in one or two, one of two emotional stances towards life. One is that I, I'm, I at times, I'm the guy, the irritated guy that's on the muscle with people that flies off on the handle, uh, you know, that's really kind of a pain in the ass to be around. Or I'm the guy that's so threatened and rubbed the wrong way by you and life itself that I've withdrawn so deeply into me that some psychiatrist is diagnosing me as clinically depressed. And I'm not clear, clinically depressed. I just run in here and I go too far and I stay too long and I can't get out. It's the depression of the overly self-involved. And I'm that guy. And then the last thing it says discontent. I think I heard a guy say this 25 years ago. He said that alcoholism was a disease of chronic malcontent. There's something about me that I never wanted to admit really is that no matter what good things life will bring me, the shine of them wears off very quickly. And I have an inability I live in a world where people have good stuff happen, and they're five years later, they're still grateful for it. You know, I'm the guy, you give me a brand new car, within three weeks, it's the wrong color. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, 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 it's just something like that with me. And I didn't understand, why am I that way? Why does, why does nothing ever seem to f- ring my bell and really keep ringing it? And I, I just go through life, I go from one thing to another. This is it. No, it's not. This is it. No, that ain't either. This is it. No, that ain't it. She, oh, she's it. No, she wasn't. This job is it. No, that wasn't it. And it's just, I just go like that. It's just from one thing to another. And it, it always appears like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Right? It's my whole life's like that. The disillusionment, the high hopes, and then the do. The, 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 you know, it's like awful. And I'm this, this chronic malcontent. And I'll tell you what I think it is. I think once you've tasted the connectedness that you get in the early days of drinking, once you've tasted that thing that happens to you after about five or six drinks and you can come out and play and you're in the zone and you can sing better than you can sing and you can dance better than you can dance and you're funnier than you've ever been and you can talk to members of the alcohol of the opposite sex and you, you're a part of and you know the glory of that, then everything in life pales by comparison. And what happens to me is I'm sober and I know I can't drink. It's killing me. But I don't feel very good. And I see a, I see a job and I think, my, and I, this happened to me. There were some guys I knew that had this job working in this steel mill. And this is back in the mid-70s and they were making 20-some dollars an hour. That was an, that's like $200 an hour today. And I remember thinking to myself, my God, if I had a job like that, I'd be there. I'd be there. I'd, you'd never get the feeling like if you were properly financed, you'd no longer feel the way you feel. You know what I mean? That kind of thing, right? And I, and I got that job. I got that job. And I'll tell you, it wasn't, it wasn't even a month before I realized that this was, that they, they really didn't appreciate what I was doing and they were taking advantage of me and, you know, and it was just people there were crap heads and it was, uh, and I eventually left. I remember, I, I grew up with a guy. We used to drink together. He did not have alcoholism, even though at times he looked like he did. He was a problem drinker. He had acute alcoholic. He was an acute alcoholic rather than chronic. And uh, he met this girl, and uh, they got together, and they were getting married, and she uh, gave him an ultimatum. She said, you know, I, I don't want you, I, I can't live with this partying like you're partying. And you've got to make a choice. 
And he was, he was very much in love with her. And he said, no problem, sweetheart. And he put the plug in the jug and never looked back and never went back. Walked away from that way of life. Walked away from it. And I remember him seeing him doing that. And I remember thinking to myself, man, well, yeah. If I had somebody that loved me the way she loved him, <laughs> I would probably be able to quit drinking. And you know what the problem with that is? is not a, I found people that loved me the way she loved him. And I'd find them and it'd be great for a while. And then after a little while, I'd start... No, you know, i just start noticing... I got one of those noticers. You know what I mean? You, I get, you get me restless, irritable, and discontent. I can, I, I can find, I, I tell you, I could find a turd at a buffet. You know what I mean? I guess I'm that kind of consciousness when I get like that. My head gets like that. And I, uh, I think what was happening is I compared what it, I, without realizing it, subconsciously, never aware of it, I think on an emotional level, I eventually started to compare what it felt like to have that job and make all that money sober to what it felt like to have five shots of Jack Daniels. And all of a sudden, the job didn't really do it. And then I started to compare what it felt like to have this gal love me to what it felt like to have seven shots of Jose Cuervo. And it wasn't the same thing. Now, I never sat down consciously and thought any of that. But that's almost as if what was going on inside of me. I was expecting, I was expecting these things to be a treatment for the spiritual malady of alcoholism. You see, when I stop drinking, I start to get sick of spirit. And I don't, it's not, that's not really a religious thing. If you've ever, if you've ever entered into a state of forced abstinence, whether it's your idea or somebody else's, it doesn't matter and you're just not drinking, you know, if you're a real alcoholic, what it feels like to suffer from alcoholism sober. And I'll tell you why it's a spiritual deal, because you could be put on an MRI when you're feeling like that, and it will show up, nothing's wrong. But I'll tell you, if you've ever had that thing eat your soul in here, it's as real as you are. And it does not exist on any kind of material or physiological plane. But it is real as I am. And when I would have five shots of Jack Daniels, this, this spirit that seemed to get sick and depressed and removed and disconnected once I entered into abstinence, five shots of whiskey vitalized that spirit when it worked. Now, it didn't do that at the end. Because the alcoholism moved into a, the chronic, into the advanced stages where it stopped doing that for me. But it did that at one time. And so I enter into abstinence and I'm restless, I'm irritable, I'm discontent. Until I can again experience a sense of ease and comfort. Ease and comfort which, where, which I will frantically look everywhere for and fail to find until I eventually return to alcohol. Tried meds, tried smoking stuff. I did marijuana maintenance. For, I was sober one time for about six months on marijuana maintenance, uh, about as long as I could stand it. I was sober a couple times, several months on, for not, never a year, but a good part of a year one time on meds. Um, but the thing is, I really hunger for a higher level of relief from my spirit than I was getting in marijuana, than I was getting in the medication. And so all it did for me was start a slow burn inside of me that eventually made me yearn for, for the next level up, right? I'm the kind of guy, you give me a little, a little bit of relief from the way I feel sober. I don't know about you guys, has a little bit of relief ever been enough for you? Really? I mean, you know what I mean? A little bit? It's still, don't tease me. I mean, you're just teasing me. You might pacify me for a period of seven, eight, ten months, but eventually, now you've opened the door, I know there's more relief there. You've reminded me. And you've teased me. And I'm going to eventually, I just go for it. I, I just can't help it. Because I got chronic alcoholism. I get a disease that starts where the bottle ends. And I start to become sick of spirit. Um, page 30, more about alcoholism. The book says, most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics. 
I didn't, I tell you, I spent, I don't know why I didn't want to be an alcoholic, but I went to incredible lengths to not be an alcoholic. I thought I was willing to be a drug addict. I was willing to be a mental patient. I was willing to have grave emotional problems. I was willing to be a relationship addict. I was willing to be anything about except an alcoholic. But I don't want to be an alcoholic because then the gig's up. Then I got to quit drinking. I mean, that's not right. I don't want to. Do that. I don't want to be an alcoholic. I don't want to be an alcoholic. I because alcoholism is irreparable. I want to be something that I can kind of get over. You know that. Let's get over this. Let's get on with it. Let's get over it here and go on. I want to go, and I, that's one of the reasons that AA, just, I hated AA. And I always gravitated to psychiatrists. I liked psychiatrists. And, because I remember being in a treatment center, and I used to end up, I kept ending up in AA over and over again. And I kept thinking, I'm not an alcoholic, but God, why is it every time I drink, I end up where all the alcoholics are at? What's, what's, what's with this? And I'm telling this guy in his treatment center one day, I said, I don't want to go to that AA. They're so negative. They talk about this absolute abstinence and this powerlessness and they can't manage your own life. If you say that crap enough, you'll start to believe it. Why do I don't want to go there. It's negative, 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 negative. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a real alcoholic. I don't want to be. I, want, I like therapy because I want to get fixed. And I remember I had this illusion. I knew I was, I was screwed up. But I couldn't figure out why. And I didn't come from an alcoholic home. That would have made it easier. If my parents would have abused me and been bad drunks, I could have said, well, sure, look. They did this to me, see? But my parents loved me. My parents were never hurt. They were, I went out of their way. They sacrificed for me. They, did, I was the cent they loved me. That was the center of their life. And I thought to myself, I remember going to this therapist and I'm telling him, I, you know, I know my parents, it seemed like they were good parents, but I suspect that they must have damaged me because I felt damaged. I suspected they must, somebody must have done this to me. And we spent a long time in therapy, never figured it out. So I got him to send me to a hypnotherapist because I figured I must have blocked it out. You know, they probably miss potty trained me or something, and I, I didn't. I blocked it out. It was so horrible. Blocked it out, and it scarred me and warped me the rest of my life. And through hypnotherapy, I'll uncover what that is, deal with it, and like a child's helium balloon that's released, I will soar into mental health. And I remember going to, I got regressed back through my childhood, and we spent like a long time in this hypnotherapy, going back through stages and the years and touch. And I never found out what it was because I don't have a environmentally induced illness. I don't have a psychological illness, even though it looks like it. The book has makes a statement that's very, very amazing. It says that when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. Well, if that's true, and that's really what alcoholics, the people who you watch get better, and Alcoholics Anonymous and healthier, they get, they get healthier not through trying to make themselves healthier physically or mentally. They get healthier by applying spiritual principles to their life. And what happens is they straighten out mentally and physically. Well, if that's true through cause and effect, then maybe the reverse is true. Maybe I got crazy and looked like a nutcase because I was so sick of spirit that it was like a stone in my shoe that my head just spun on trying to figure out and control. Maybe my disconnection and my inability to integrate myself in life because of a spiritual state of separation just made me crazy in the loneliness wrapped up inside my own head. The book says when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. I want to tell you something. My head does not do what it used to do to me. And physically, I, as a result of that, I haven't had to punish myself physically, and I am physically probably in the best shape of my life. And I'm mentally probably in the best shape of my life. If you don't leave me alone for too long. <laughs> That's why I'm an everyday member of AA. got a sponsor, and I sponsor guys. Uh, because I could go, I could kind of 
drift back to it's it it's not that I get sick. You know what happens when I get sick? It's not I'm not sick, but you look sick to me. You know what I mean? I, when I'm getting spiritually sick, it looks like to me you're getting ill. And I have this urgency to straighten you out. And that's a lonely business when you get like that. It's a lonely, lonely business. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. I will always be that way. Uh, I'll never overcome that. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday... He will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. The book talks about three illusions or delusions in alcoholism. This is not denial. This is more hideous than denial. Denial is like... Uh, I stole your wallet. You asked me if I've seen your wallet, and I got it in my pocket. I know I got it, and I lied to you. I deny that I got your wallet. This is not denial. This is like I got your wallet, and I don't even believe I got your wallet. Right? I'm like, <laughs> And then, what is it that, that, that I can control and enjoy my drinking? What's that mean? It means that I'm going to be able to get back to the good old days in spite of the fact that I haven't been able to do that. And that I'm going to be able to jumpstart the party and get back to those days when it was glorious. Get back to those days where where you're walked into a bar and you can't talk to anybody and you're depressed and your head's spinning and you can't get your own life off of you and you have five shots of Jose Cuervo and you come out and play seven shots and you look around the bar and realize I love all these people (laughs) I love you man did you ever ever get I remember I remember being at this bar they used to go to this this, this, like this bar was like sacred ground for me because I could walk in there so sick and after a little period of time of drinking just feel so a part of and I remember feeling so connected in love with the people in there would almost bring tears to my eyes. You know, just like, oh, when you've been as lonely and as isolated as I had been, to all of a sudden be a part of like that is a tremendous thing. Tremendous thing. And that I have the illusion that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy it like that one more time. In spite of overwhelming evidence that the last couple of years I drank, it, it's not like that anymore. It's not that party. And it says to control it. I've never been so deluded to imagine when I went on a run after a period of several months of abstinence that I'm not going to pay a price. I always knew that. I always knew that there was a price to be paid. My delusion is that I have enough control to keep the price down to something I can live with. Right? (laughs) That's the delusion. That's a delusion that my one friend had, uh, that I heard of, that my one friend who told me about a guy that he sponsored who went on his last run. He was sober about two years. And he woke up in jail. And he was, and this is a guy that was, he was a, a bookkeeper. I mean, he was like a real milk toast guy that never got in trouble. And he was, he came to in jail and he, in a blackout, he had shot and killed his wife and kids and tried to kill himself, and they took the gun away from him. And it was the great, oops, maybe I can't control it as much as I thought I could. See, when I would drink, at the, as the disease progressed in me, what happened is two things that were hideous. Is one thing, as the disease progressed, my ability to have fun and reap ease and comfort and can be connected and, and have a party and come out and play got less and less and less. And at the same time, the problems got more and more and more. And it was almost as if over the years, as I drank, some hideous force was changing things. In the very beginning, when I would start drinking, it was like spinning a roulette wheel. 
and I'd go on a run. And on that roulette wheel, there'd be drag racing, and dancing, and getting laid, and jam sessions, and singing a cappella music with the guys. It'd be a little bit of throwing up occasionally. A little bit of getting in trouble once in a while. But for the most part, it would come up, that roulette wheel would come up good stuff. And this hideous force that, that's part of the progression of the disease, it was like snuck in there and started changing crap on that wheel. And putting up more wet pants, blackouts, uh, going to jail, getting physically sick, crying jags, broken noses, fights. Until the very end, I'm spinning that wheel thinking frantically, there's got to be a party in here somewhere. I know there's got to be. Right? If I could make it come up party 50% of the time, and I could keep the damage down to something that's a price to pay, but something I can live with, I'll tell you something, I'd still be drinking. I'd have never got sober. I did not get sober because I came to my senses one day and realized this is something I really should do. <laughs> a guy with more mental health than me maybe could have done that, not me. I had to take it to three years past the point where it's fun anymore and I, my life is, the price I'm paying is hideous. And I go on a run, I don't know what's going to happen. I go on a run and I just may get drunk, drunk and feel sorry for myself and feel bad and be sick and hung over. Or I might come to in a jail cell as I did up in Maine covered with blood and don't know why I'm there and find out that I, the only friend I had left on the face of the earth, I took a hunting knife with a blade this long and opened his chest up. Or I just might get a DUI or I don't know what's going to happen. I never knew. A lot of times I could, it would be kind of you'd sneak by. Do you, ever, do you ever have that feeling when you're hung over after a run and you, you've checked everything out and there's nothing coming at you and you're not going to jail and there's no dents in the car that are new and it's just kind of like you stuck by that one, right? Now, I had that a lot. And at the, at the times at the end when there wasn't a price to pay started becoming rarer. Because I can't control it and I can't enjoy it. And I'll tell you, I think I could have never. That's, that's the illusion that kept me from getting a foothold in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I'll tell you something. As long as I secretly in the back of my mind thought that there was some ease and comfort left in getting high. Even though I intellectually know I shouldn't do that. As long as I think there's still some party left in there. And that I can reap that party and reap that ease and comfort and keep the damage down to something I can live with. I'll tell you something. I got a back door right out of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'll tell you about a guy like me. You get me restless enough, irritable enough, discontent enough, disappointed enough, bored enough, lonely enough, disillusioned enough. If I got a back door... Why should I, you go to my sponsor and work those steps? I'm out of here. I'm out of here. And that's the kind of guy I am. And until that illusion was smashed, I could never get a foothold in here because I never was forced through a lack of alternatives to have to come into AA and buy this whole package and make this the center of my life. For seven years, I had that delusion that I could still have some fun, or maybe if I changed the combination, change the, the, you know, the things I'm smoking with the things I'm drinking, and get the combination just right. You know, if I get it just right. As long as I had that, I wasn't going to be one of you. I wasn't. I was part of the group it talks about in chapter five, the part that didn't wasn't desperate enough and out of alternatives enough to have to do what you do. I was part of that group that doesn't recover. It says those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. I was part of that group, not because I'm stupid and not because I'm lazy and not because I'm a bad guy, simply because I had a delusion that I had an alternative subconsciously that I was never even thought about consciously. I had a back door. This was just, it became a temporary place I came for a while as long as it felt okay 
And when the, my emotions started putting the screws to me, I'm gone. Why am I gone? Because I think I can. In the back of my mind, I think I can. And that's the kind of drunk I am. Some people may have the ability to overcome that mentally and realize intellectually through a treatment center or something that I really shouldn't drink anymore, and that's enough for them. It never was enough for me. Because when my emotions are putting the screws to me, all the intellectual knowledge in the world that relief is not a good idea still makes, doesn't change the fact that re, the illusion of relief is still the illusion of relief. It's like having my hand in a vice and having the guy start to turn the vice. After when the bones start to crunch a little bit, all, doing just about anything to get relief seems like a good idea. And the problem with restless, irritable, and discontent, the problem with the way I suffer from alcoholism once I stop drinking, it's not a dramatic suffering. It's hideous because it's so low level. It's just below the level of my consciousness. You know what it's like? You remember, see the, remember back in World War II, the Japanese used to use a thing called the water torture. You ever hear about that? It's the craziest thing. They take a guy and they, they strap him to a table or a chair or something and they tell him that you're going to tell us everything you know because we're going to drop beads of water on your head. The guy goes, beads of water? Come on, man. It's beads of water. Go ahead. Come on. Let them happen. You know, go ahead. Hit me with your biggest bead of water. Right? And they said, yeah, you're laughing. Ah, beads of water. <laughs> I tell you, a week later, you'd do anything to get them to stop that. Anything. And that's the way getting sick of spirit is. It's something you can't, you, you don't connect the dots that this is bothering you. Because if when you're sick of heart, if somebody asks you what's wrong, you don't know. It's because I, I don't know really. There's nothing I can hang it on. It's just, there's just this sense that, that nothing's really right. Restless, irritable, and discontented unless I can again experience a sense of ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks that I live in a world and see others take on a regular basis with impunity, which means impunity just means without punishment. It comes from the word punis, meaning punishment. They take it without punishment because they don't have alcoholism. And I tell you, it's... I, um, I had a guy, a sponsor, a few years ago. He was, uh, he was, uh, had a roommate. And his roommate started to drink again. And he asked me, he said, what should I ask him to leave? What should I do? And I said, how are they drinking? And he said, it's the funniest thing. They're having a good time and they're getting away from it. They're getting away with it. They're not paying any price. They're able to control it. I said, that's the, I said, you'd be better off exposed to somebody that was falling down and breaking their nose because you'll look at him and this guy was new in sobriety. You'll look at him and you'll start to think, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could do that. Mm, dangerous stuff. Control and enjoy my drinking. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. Now, I know in Chapter 5 and in every wall and every meeting hall in the country, it has the 12 steps, and it says in Step 1 and all that, it says we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. But here it says it a little different. And this means more to me. It says we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. I'll tell you why that means more to me. I, you put me in a treatment center and you let me watch the doctor, doctors talk about alcoholism and the Father Martin movies and the lectures and all that. And intellectually, I'll get it and I'll admit that I'm an alcoholic. No problem. I'll admit that I'm powerless over alcohol. Yeah, I can see the physics. I can see how the acetatane and the all that stuff reacts in me. Sure, sure, I get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
But there's a big difference between admitting something and seeing it intellectually and getting it in your innermost self. Big difference. I, there was an old friend of mine who used to say, uh, the greatest journey for, is from the head to the heart in the innermost self. And see, until I got it down in here, it was just all thinking stuff. It didn't make any, it didn't have any impact on me. It didn't force me to come here. You know how you can tell whether you got it in your head or you got it in your innermost self? Watch your feet. Look at your feet. I'll tell you what my experience is with people who really get step one in their innermost self. They will act like hopeless, desperate, frantic people for looking for an answer. They will go to 10 or 15 meetings a week. They will get a sponsor. They will call that sponsor. They will be trying to figure out or get help to work those steps. They will do whatever it takes because they get it, that they're dying. People who get it up here but don't get it in here secretly believe in here that they can control and enjoy it, that it's really not a hopeless condition of mind and body, that they're really not all that powerless. will act that way. And they'll come to meetings and because they, you know, they get it, I should probably go to these meetings. Sort of like need a little social support here for the AA to them is like the sober elks. You know what I mean? It's like it's not a life and death matter. But I'll tell you what happens to a guy like me who, who came here like that. And that's how I came to AA. After seven years of relapsing, after getting to a place where I can't stand it anymore, and I'm standing on a bridge with a bottle of Richard's Wild Irish Rose trying to get up enough courage to take my life and failing because I'm a coward and ending up in Alcoholics Anonymous one more time, I started acting in AA with a desperation that I only ever acted like that is when I really, really needed a drink and I was trying to figure out a way to get one. And I started approaching Alcoholics Anonymous the way I approached alcohol when I really, really needed a drink. And my life started to change. And I didn't know that I got out of the group that refused to completely give themselves to this simple program because I had a back door out of AA. And all of a sudden, I was in the group that was. I was the frantic. I'd become, as the book says, we are alcoholics of the hopeless variety. Down in my innermost self, I got it. I was dying. I'm hopeless. I have failed. I tried everything. And I started acting like someone who was hopeless, desperately, frantically seeking hope. And then this next line... It's what I think takes a lot of people out of here after they're sober 10 years or 5 years or 3 years. I become a student of relapse. And I'll tell you why. I think in order to stay here, you have to know how to leave here. So I watch people who leave here and I watch them real close and I try to figure out what they're doing because I believe that if I have the same disease that you have, what could happen to you could happen to me. So if you end up dying of alcoholism or blowing your brains out with 20 years of sobriety or doing any of that stuff or getting on pills and getting strung out or whatever it is, I want to know what you're doing so I can go down a different road. Because I believe that if I have what you have and I go down the road you went down, I will probably experience what you experienced and probably react to it the way you reacted to it. To tell me, oh, I'm above that. I know better. I've, I learned my lesson. But then eh, it's all crap, really. Really. That's all the, that's all the blusterings of a, of a defense mechanism inside of me. The real truth is that it could happen to you, it could happen to me. And it says here, the, the, it talks about another delusion. The delusion that we are like other people or presently may be like other people, has to be smashed. What's that mean, other people? People who don't have alcoholism. People who don't have a spiritual malady coupled with a mental obsession and a physical allergy. People who don't have to treat the spiritual malady, as it talks about on page 20, where it says, our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend upon our constant thought of others, their needs, and how we can work for them. As it says throughout the whole 
big book. It talks about in places where you must continually do this. You must continually do that or you're going to, probably going to drink again. The delusion that I no longer have alcoholism, the delusion that maybe I'm normal now. There's a great, I tell you, there's a great drive in every alcoholic I've ever known to kind of get over your alcoholism. You know what I mean? Like maybe after 10 years, I'm, and you watch it. I, I do a meeting a minimum of twice a week uh, in rehabs. Uh, right now, actually, I'm doing three. Uh, most of the time I do three, but I never, in 25 years, have done less than two meetings a week. And these skid row places and these places where you see the guys that had had 15 and 20 and 25 and 30 years that drank again. You won't see them in your regular AA meetings because the disease has progressed within them while they were sober. And when they drink again, they never have even get back into mainstream AA. They die on, and these are guys that had million dollar homes end up dying on the streets because of the progression of the disease. You very rarely will ever see a guy that had 15 or 20 years of sobriety that drinks again, coming back into mainstream AA and getting a foothold again. Not that it doesn't happen, but it is, it's rare. Most of those guys die on Skid Row. And if you watch them, it's the same. I've, I've been sober now long enough to watch guys come into AA and drink or commit suicide 20 years later, right? And I'll tell you what I observe in almost every case. They come into Alcoholics Anonymous. They have been beaten half to death by drugs and alcohol. And they get it that they're alcoholic. They get it that they're hopeless. They feel hopeless. And they act hopeless. But in the back of their mind is still this delusion that maybe someday they will overcome this. And what happens is recovery lends itself to that delusion. One of, the, one of the downsides of recovery from the 12 steps in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is you get better. And that's the downside of it because as I get better and I get financially successful and my relationships with people are better and I get self-esteem and I integrate myself into the community and my life is really good and I am not thinking about drinking and haven't thought about it in decades, it's easy with a half million dollars in the bank and a big house and community support and respect and family and all the good stuff in life, it's easy to get deluded into a false sense of okayness, almost as if if you were to be honest with yourself, you'd kind of say, boy, you know, I don't feel alcoholic like I used to, right? I don't even feel like there's a problem here. And you get, you get seduced by the fruits of your own recovery into a false sense of, of okayness. And then what happens is that they do the walk, the walk of death. Guys that come into AA, go to seven meetings a week, work with a sponsor, sponsor people, make amends, have commitments, do all that stuff. Everyday members, every day is the day that they participate in their own recovery. Five years later, with a thriving business, making six figures a year in a house and a wife and kids. Now they're about half as active as they were in the beginning. And then another five years down the road as success accumulates and now they got a couple $80,000 cars and a couple Harleys and maybe a second home in Hawaii and, and their kids are getting older and they're, just, they're doing more, they're, play, they're coaching softball. And now maybe they've come into that area where they really don't have time to sponsor anybody or do any 12-step calls. And they really don't have time for service. And they, they try to get to a meeting once a week if they can. But you know something? If they can't, they have that false sense of, that's all right, I feel fine. And then one day, out of nowhere, and I've seen this happen so many times, the obsession to drink will just return, and it returns so quickly, it just overwhelms them. And the funny thing is you ask these guys that, that have taken the walk of diminishing amounts of involvement, and the walk really, their feet speak louder than their words or their thoughts or their feelings. Their feet describe the actions of someone who must secretly believe as time goes on 
that I don't really have alcoholism like I used to? Really? And if you'd ask these guys that relapse after 5 or 10 or 20 years, if you'd put them on a lie detector and you'd say, a week before you drank again, was there ever a thought that you'd ever drink again? And you know what they always say? I hear this so many times. They said, a week before I picked up that drink, I'd have bet anything I was never going to drink again. And then they do. And then they do. There's a a line on... Uh, page 24, that I think explains it. It explains two things. We already talked, there's a dynamic that happens in alcoholism that makes guys like me have no mental defense against the next drink. Page 24 in italics, it says, the fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. If I can't do it for a week or a month ago, how am I going to do it for 10 years? And I'll tell you what happens. And this is a phenomenon that, that's not, I don't think it's reserved to alcoholism, but the further I get away from the pain of my last run, it's, it, it's the, the vaguer and the hazier the memory becomes. And it's not that I don't remember that I was in jail, and it's not that I don't remember I was in detox, and it's not that I don't remember intellectually. It just doesn't have any, it doesn't have sufficient force because there's no emotion involved in it. What happens is that you remember it intellectually, but there's no impact in that. It's a very similar experience that women have with childbirth. If a woman could experientially and emotionally remember the pain of childbirth, she would never, ever do that again. I'm telling you. But what happens, I've heard, heard a hundred women say this, is you get away from it, and you kind of remember intellectually that it was bad, but... I mean, how bad was it? And look how cute those babies are. You know what I mean? It's right until you're having your their first big contraction, and then you go, "Boy, was this a mistake!" <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And I think the same thing is with alcoholism. And what happens? Silkworth says we stop drinking and become restless, irritable, and discontent. And the further I get away from the last drink, the the more vaguer and hazier the memory of the pain is. So I go into a detox center, fresh in my mind the pain because I'm still living it. If it was a balanced scale, here's the memory at two weeks sober of my last run would still have a lot of depth and weight. It's pretty fresh. It hasn't, the emotional impact hasn't started to evaporate as of yet. If it was a balanced scale, it would weigh that scale down. Over here, light, but not yet so pronounced. There's some feelings of restless, some feelings of irritability, maybe. Some feelings of discontent, maybe a little depression, maybe a little anxiety as your head spins a little bit. But really, nothing to put up with. They're just starting to drop the water drops on your forehead. It ain't too bad yet, right? It's nothing. Bring it at me. And what happens, the further I get away from the last drink, the vaguer this memory becomes and the more this has weight because it wears on me. And the balance scales start to tip. And then one day, when a guy's right about here, you go up to this guy and you could say, is there any chance you'll ever drink again? He, absolutely not. Alcohol almost killed me. Went to jail and everything. And then a week later, it's gone like this. And a guy who just a week before said he'd never drink again finds himself picking up a drink because the feelings are driving him and he can't grab on to the experience of the pain with any sufficient force to deter him. And that exact dynamic happened to me over and over and over again. And there was nothing I could do to stop that process. I was absolutely powerless. As it says later in the book, the alcoholic's problem lies mainly in his mind. 
when the emptiness of the spiritual malady wears on me, it will use my own mind against me to always set me up for that stuff. And I can't stop that process. Let's take a five-minute break, cigarette bathroom break, and then we'll uh, come back and we'll, we'll move into step two.